Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular lesson is part of a series for the fourth quarter of 2012. In fact, this is the very last of those lessons, lesson number 13 for December 12, 29 of 2012. And before we start, we'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. One, grab your Bible if you have it available. And then we're going to have a word of prayer that God may guide us in our discussion. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we come before you thinking about the events that still might happen, still will happen ahead of us. Considering in this lesson the second coming, the millennium, the third coming, and what goes beyond, Help us to think clearly about those issues so that we may be prepared, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just as a reminder, God's original plan for us was for all of us to be living in the Garden of Eden in perfect peace and harmony, able to walk with God at any time, to talk with the angels, etc. That was God's plan. Well, sin changed all of that, as you know. But what needs to happen to restore the peace and harmony that was God's original intention? And why does Jesus need to come the second time to take the saints to heaven for a thousand years, leaving the wicked dead here on this earth while Satan and his angels are confined to this earth? When the new Jerusalem with God, the angels, and all the saints come down to this earth again at the third coming, why will it be necessary for God to allow Satan once again to take control of all the wicked? With just a few exceptions, every person who has ever lived will be alive on this earth at the same time. The wicked outside the city and the righteous inside the city. As the wicked approach the holy city after preparing for their attack on that city, now we're talking about the third coming here, they, they are stopped in their tracks by a glorious panorama appearing in the heavens. You can read about that in the book Great Controversy by Ellen White, page 666. You might be able to remember that number, too. The most important events in the history of the Great Controversy will be presented in that panorama just as they happen. The evidence of the truth will be so compelling that even Satan himself will be down on his knees acknowledging that what God did was right. Of course, you can read about that in Philippians chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. Then the wicked will turn on Satan and his angels and others who have led them astray. Finally, admitting that there is no reason for them to continue to exist, the wicked accept their fate and are consumed by God's glory. After being destroyed by fire, the entire surface of the earth will be remade like a glorious new Garden of Eden for God and his people to dwell on forever. I hope by now we've raised a number of questions in your mind. Does, why does God need to take so long to accomplish these final few steps in the Great Conference? I mean, if the judgment needs to be announced, why doesn't God just announce it and, and, and wrap things up? Wouldn't that be the most efficient way to do things? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not within the context that he would, uh, not trying to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Oh, so there's something else that needs to be accomplished. What would that be? Well, haven't we thought for our whole years here together that we have been showing that God is demonstrating. He's taking the time to lay it out and let the process show that he is exactly right in what he said and how he handled it. And what he's doing now and what he does then is furtherance of that demonstration. Okay. And of course, Second Peter tells us that a thousand days is a thousand years is like a day in his sight. So take a thousand years. That's okay. We don't have a problem with that, right? Oh. Of course, if we're planning to live with him forever, the righteous will be planning to live with him forever. A thousand years, what's that? That's just a good start, right? It's a day. A day. <laughs> Well, if Satan can be successfully bound at the second coming, why should he be released again to tempt the people at the third coming? Isn't that a fair question? More of the demonstration. What's going to be demonstrated? That's the question. What's going to be demonstrated, though, is that 
that the judgment that he made and and was demonstrated during the thousand years or was was looked at during the thousand years will be demonstrated to be true as every one of those that's outside comes to charge the the city okay and and, and the question that follows along with that if all the wicked are dead why not just leave them dead why do you resurrect them because they haven't had the final demonstration Okay, what difference does that demonstration make? It takes away all possibility of questions. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what this whole demonstration is about, to eliminate all questions about God for eternity. Well, I also heard that um, when Satan is bound for a thousand years, he gets to look at what he's done for a thousand years. Mm -hmm. What good is that? Because it okay. looks like he doesn't, it doesn't do him any good. Okay, let's think about our groups. We know that God will be in heaven, Jesus will be in heaven, the Holy Spirit will be in heaven, the angels are in heaven, the righteous are in heaven with them, all up there, wherever that is. Okay? Think about what they will be doing. By contrast, Satan will be where? Down here. Satan and all his angels. cohorts, cohorts, his evil angels will be here, confined to this earth. What do we mean? You know, Revelation 20 says that they will be bound, chained, if you will, to this earth. What, what does that mean? Well, they can't go to heaven, apparently, like they used to be able to do. Why not? Because no one will accept them there. No one will listen to them. And there's no one, they will be bound to this earth. There's no one here on this earth to listen to them either. Mm -hmm. Because? Everyone's dead. The, Except, the wicked are all dead. Yeah, the wicked yeah. are dead. The righteous are gone to heaven. Well, it appears like he's in the pit. Yeah. Right then. When you're in the pit, you can't go anywhere. You can't, you can't get out. You don't have any freedom. It's probably because he's, he's just plain worked out everything he could possibly work out, and he has nowhere to go now. Maybe that's why Revelation calls it a pit. Yeah. I think it's I think it's very very symbolic of what what he will be in when he's on this earth, you know, not being able to go anywhere. Well, having said all that, now Norma said several times, excuse me, so, several times as some kind of a demonstration. What are, what's being demonstrated? I believe um, we don't need to demonstrate anymore to anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe this is punishment to stay oh, on yeah. an empty, empty, empty world, or? world, dark, no sun, that means no vegetation, no living creature, and just stay. It's a punishment. Well, it's what, normal what, to be punished. What, what good is a punishment if you're just going to be dead afterwards? He punished for thousands of years. Uh, you know, what good people. is it? What good is it? I mean, what good is it? Is it going to make him better? Is it going to make anybody time, worse? This is the time is it for judgment in the heaven. Judgment and after, after a thousand years will be execution. But he was a creature. And a creature, by definition, is something the Creator cr made. And he, the creature did not ask to come into existence right and so that being the case uh, the creature chose because uh, to live in the out of harmony with the way the creator designed things to operate so rather than just letting him go why would it be to anybody's benefit to see that uh, one of God's creatures or many of God's creatures that apparently the third of the angels that were cast out of heaven to this earth are ultimately going to be tortured for eternity. Or just tortured and then finally die. What, what is the purpose? What are we learning from that? What is anybody learning? This is not torture. You're just staying here in a prison. Oh, I understand that. I mean, I could, but as, uh, we, we, maybe, maybe I have a problem with the definitions. Because, um, yeah, it's not a pleasant thing just to sit here uh, and twiddle in their thumbs and play in tiddlywinks with... For <laughs> For, well, th I, I, for a thousand I, years. I think that there's something more to be said. Okay. I, I tend to be on Norm's side on this one. 
uh, that there's something to be demonstrated. Oh, I'm, a, I'm in agreement with that. Yeah. L let's think about that. Um, there's actually, as I understand it, three levels of active judgment, evaluation and judgment going on in the final phase of this world's, world's history. We're going to talk about that a little bit later on, but let me just, maybe I should do it now since we're, since we're in it. There's the pre-advent judgment going on right now, as we under starting having started in 1844. And of course, you wonder why do we need a pre-advent judgment? Well, we need a pre-advent judgment because at the advent, God is going to take the righteous to heaven. He's going to leave the wicked here dead. So someone has to decide somehow or other who's going to go and who's going to stay. So we need a pre-advent judgment because that kind of decision needs to be made. Okay? Uh, now, I guess we should back up a second and say, if it was just God that was involved, how long would it take him to make those kind of decisions? He knew it before it, it <laughs> took place. He could have the whole thing solved in an instant. So it has to be more than God involved because obviously, you know, he knows the whole story. He's got the whole thing. And I don't know what kind of storage units he uses, but obviously he's got... He's infinite. So yeah. here we're trying, us finite beings are trying he, to understand he, he the knows, infinite. He knows the whole story. So he's taking time for other people to follow along. Well, when you say other people, what do you mean? Well, other people, other, the people he needs to agree with him. Who would that be? The people that are going to stay with him Who? for eternity. Who? How about the angels in heaven and the other? Uh, well, didn't I say that? Yeah. <laughs> so I just want to <laughs> emphasize so that point. The creatures that we are going to live next door to for eternity need to know that we are trustworthy if okay. we're if God deems us that way. Okay, so something or does need to be demonstrated. We're not trustworthy if we aren't. We need to, we, those people need to be satisfied that if some of us are going to be there, it's safe to live next door to us. Okay, that would be the first, the, the pre-advent judgment. Well, then what's going to happen during the thousand years? Those of us who are here on earth are going to have the opportunity to understand why so-and-so that we think was an outstanding Christian, why he or she is not there. It's a judgment of uh, wicked pe mm -hmm. people. Yeah. Well, and the righteous people too, because they, they're the ones who are going to be able to get, oh, I mean the thousand years. Yeah, the thousand years is going to be a time for the, the, the saints from this earth go to heaven and say, but we have some questions about God's judgment. Why did he do this? Why, did, who, why is that person here? Why is this person not here? Da, 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 da. And so this is a chance for the righteous who are there to find out. I don't think they go up there and say, we've got questions about God's judgment. Well, no. They may have questions that he needs to answer, mm -hmm. questions about what happened, that, they're, that they need information and they need what he knows. They need to understand as he understands, but they're not going to be arguing about his judgment. Well, but in effect, let's be honest, in effect, what you're asking is, what about God's judgment? Well, another thing that's happening is just that's going to happen is that this is the first time that men, that humanity is going to be able to live without Satan and his angels at their heels all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So um, I think what happens at the end of the thousand years there's going to be things happening different than it's ever happened before, just because Satan and his angels aren't there anymore. And, um, and that tells you something about whether sin and righteousness can live cohabitate to each, with each other. They can't. Mm -hmm. And so I think that will be another indication that sin does need to be put down for, for heaven to continue. Okay. Then I would say after the thousand years of the third coming, that panorama in the sky where everything is going to be shown, basically the, the, the basic story of the great controversy is going to be shown. Ellen White goes on to say that every person will see the part they played in that picture. So at that point in time, now we, we've said the angels are convinced before the second coming. The righteous are convinced before the third coming during the third coming at the time of that panorama all the wicked will be convinced in other words by the time god gets ready to remake this earth 
into a Garden of Eden. Every person, wicked, righteous, human, angels, the rest of the universe, every one of them will say, yes, God, you did everything you could possibly do to save even sinners. I think we have to make a real clear distinction that the knowledge and, accept, and, and admitting that something is right does not mean that that has become part of the character, that that is something that they would operate from forever. Because th after that, the wicked get together and going to charge the city. So yeah. just, just say, yeah. yeah, okay, yeah, you're right. But I'm going to see if I can do you in anyway. Yeah. Well, and, and this, is, this has been demonstrated many times. People go to very powerful movies, and they're just swept along with the emotion and the so forth. I mean, look at movies about Second World War and so forth. You just say, whoa, you know, think about what you would do. I mean, you just think, boy, if I were there, I would do this and this and this kind of stuff. But that doesn't mean that you really want to be there. It doesn't mean you really want to. You know, you come out, well, you know, we're, we, we're living 50 years after that. It's not like that anymore, 60 years later, whatever. So I think it's, it's one of those kind of experiences, as you've suggested. Um, well, I, I kind of think that that kind of experience is going to happen with Satan and his angels also, because yeah. I really think that when they're sitting there looking at what they've done for a thousand years, and they don't have anybody to attempt, but they can actually look at what they're doing, they're going to know that what they were doing was stupid. I mm -hmm. mean, was, was just insane. And they'll probably wonder, you know, still, is there any possibility I can come back, mm -hmm. you know? But when the angel comes and opens up the lid again, and then they can leave, they're going to find themselves going out and starting to tempt again. Mm -hmm. And I think right then, that'll tell them something, that what they've become mm -hmm. is something that, that can't be reversed. Yeah. There's something else that we need to understand. Not only the truth about God needs to be demonstrated, the truth about Satan needs to be demonstrated. And that will happen in the final events of this earth's history before the second coming. The plagues as described in Revelation 15 and especially 16 talks about the awful things. Satan, if you stop and think about it, here's what, here's what would happen. Satan would love to have claimed every person who lives on this earth as his and say, God, just leave us alone. This is our territory. He hasn't been able to do it. There's always been a few. And at the end, there, they will be called the 144,000. There will be this group who are standing straight and tall for God, and nothing Satan can do will, will be able to change them. And it makes him furious. So what does he do? He throws the book at them, Trying to, what he would like to do is he would like to destroy the wicked and then claim, okay, I mean, I'm sorry, destroy the righteous and then claim, oh, well, there's only wicked people living here. God, leave us alone. This is our world. You can have the rest of the universe. Just leave this world to us. But the problem is that God will not allow him to destroy the righteous because God has to demonstrate something through the righteous, living through this kind of situation. And so... Satan, in the process of the final events of this earth's history, will kill literally millions of his own people in the process of trying to destroy God's people. So that's another part of the demonstration. And Satan is in a, in a catch-22, if you will. He, he wants to accomplish what he wants to accomplish, but he can't, and it just makes him furious. I wonder, though, is, is there really any honor with Satan no. and his people? I mean, no. I think he hates men anyway. He hates humanity, even if they were on his side. I don't think that they're going to. They are a creation of his arch enemy, and they are his arch enemy just because they are a creation of his. And even though he tells them maybe that they're not, he still is. He still hates still, them. It's still that way, so. They remind him of Jesus. To be, to be loyal to him may seem advantageous at the time, but man, there's no, there's no way out of that. It's, it's just going into the flames. What's different 
between when Satan was able to go and talk to God about Job uh -huh. and when he would be in God the pit. Mm -hmm. what, what's the difference? What would keep him from doing what he did before, being able to go and speak to God? The, I think the primary difference is that nobody up there is going to listen to him now. And also, he was a representative of the inhabitants of the earth. And at that well, point in time, painted. there are none. They're all dead. <laughs> yeah. I believe this is not uh, real because he never represented the earth. Yeah. He claimed. He, he claimed, claimed to be the claimed. He claimed. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Well, at the second coming, just before the second coming, there will be a, what we call a special resurrection. The people who are directly involved with the crucifixion and, and death of Jesus will be resurrected, raised to life. And people who have, who are, who have been persecuted Christians down through the years will be raised to life to see Jesus come. And again, using the words of Ellen White, it will be an absolutely incredible experience. The second coming, she says, the entire heaven, heavens will be filled with bright, shining angels. Try to imagine, you know, you look up at a, at a if, if you're out in the desert or someplace where the, where the night is really clear and you look up and there are stars everywhere, imagine if every one of those stars was a bright shining angel. Just imagine what, the, just have the a complete sky just full of bright shining angels. What an experience. Uh, so on that same thing, on one of the stations it said, if you hold a grain of wheat at arm's length and the Hubble telescope took a picture through the size of that, that thing, they focused on it for two weeks, and it was more dense than you see when you get out, uh, when you look out in the night sky. Yeah, I, I, a similar experience happened at one point back when they were in the early days of the Hubble. They, you know, they had mapped the sky, they had a pretty good idea what was up there, and they said, well, why don't we just focus for, you know, a period of time, I it was a week or something, on a, pick the biggest spot we can find in the sky where there's nothing. <laughs> well, there's nothing, okay? So they focused the Hubble te telescope on that spot where there was, quote, nothing for a week, and they came back, and I've forgotten the exact details, but there were thousands and thousands of stars and I think 17 galaxies and so forth in that, in that spot where there were nothing. So if there was an angel for each one of those, it'd be a bright sky. It would be a bright sky. It's, and, and, and just to finish up what I was going to say about the, the demonstration, um, what are we going to spend the rest of eternity talking about? A lot of things, but do we? <laughs> there's a few things, a few things that sort of stand out and are talked about in the Bible and about, and especially in the writings of Ellen White. Do you know what they are? Well, the righteousness of God. Okay. Has no end. And how is that demonstrated? Via the plan of redemption. We will spend much a good share of time to the rest of eternity talking about the plan of salvation and everything that God did. Which means that the record of all sins has to be preserved. Otherwise, if you're going to talk about the plan of salvation and you say that all sins have been wiped out, as I was taught when I was young, we're going to have to destroy all Bibles. There's going to be a huge Bible burning when we enter the, the New Jerusalem. So what? We will be leaving Bibles. <laughs> let, let, me, yeah. let me go a little different direction. What if all of the sins of the wicked were available, but the sins of the righteous were gone? Would not there be sufficient evidence of how wicked the wickedness is without a demonstration of the righteous wicked. But then okay, you wouldn't that. get the, um, the fantastic stories about yep. people that have, salvation. Have, have been converted But anybody back. could say, I was one of those and I was changed by the grace of God. What, what's, what's, <laughs> what's David going to say to Uriah when Solomon walks up to him? Oops. Question? Oops. <laughs> If you're not going to I wish them. I could remember what happened. I, I don't remember. You say, you're his son, and, and, and you're Bathsheba's daughter? Well, Bathsheba used to be my wife. How, how did that happen? I'm sorry, I can't remember. If there, no. if there wasn't, a, excuse me, if it were possible to just have God make claims, 
you wouldn't need any records. And, and there's, if you don't need the records, you don't need to have this, all this experience. God mm -hmm. could just make claims. So there's, there's some reason why these thousands of years of, of demonstration have been going on, and that need, evidence needs to be preserved. Yeah. yeah. I, I think that, that the transformation that takes part, that takes place in all of those who will be there, that those kinds of earthly questions really won't be an issue. And that Uriah and David and uh, Adam and, or Cain, <laughs> not Cain won't be there, but, but there's those who we in this world see as such contrasts, such injustices done, that those will pale into insignificance in the glory that they are, that they are living at the time and those won't be necessary. I agree to a point, but also when, uh, when Jesus was asked, which one, which one of my wives is gonna be with me in heaven? And he said, it's not gonna be that way. Yeah. Because I don't think our concept of heaven is what it's really gonna be. I don't yeah. think we can Im begin yeah. to imagine what it's gonna be. But our, our minds will be so filled with the glories and the, and the things that are there that these kinds of questions, what on earth did you do to my wife or that kind of stuff, just will not enter the mind. But part of what makes that experience glorious is the fact that we came out of this mess to get there. But we got on all, all the records of the wicked to show how nasty it was, and we were part of it. But we want to see how someone came from that to this. I think that's earthly talk. <laughs> well, <laughs> if our mind is recording all the time, that means they are stored there. We are using a, only a little bit. But when we have a full mind there, we have all our personal story very clear. We are talking about that. Mm -hmm. We have a label that is wrong, that is wrong, that is wrong. But the history, it's in our minds. Ellen mm -hmm. White talks about, in one of her visions, they were going through the, the, the new earth. And I think it was they, they came up upon Elder Fitch or mm -hmm. there was a couple of the pioneers there. And, and uh, they asked, what, what happened after that? And, and the answer was, oh, know. it's not worth talking about. Mm -hmm. And I suspect that that's kind of the model that, that all of earthly things will get when we get to heaven. Yeah, I'm, yeah and I agree with that. However, I think that we need, we need to have enough of the other. Uh, and I, think, I, I don't think God's records are going to be faulty in any way. I think the, the story, the, the thing is going to be complete. Um, and I think we'll be able to look at all that. And we won't feel about it the same way we do right now. It's not going to be, well, boy, we, you know, what were you doing kind of stuff. It will be, that's a part of the, the picture. And if we, can't, if we can't learn to live with that and be comfortable with it, maybe we don't belong there. We have to see things in contrast, of yeah. the contrast of the grace and, and the beauty and the glory of God in contrast to what sin has done. But God looks even better than if sin had not ever happened. But there's plenty. We're not making an excuse for sin, but it, there is a, a, a upside to what but has there's happened. There's plenty of contrast in in the record of those whose sins were not forgiven, whose sins were not done away with. Well, and if you want to know how I wicked, know, it, I, know. I mean, when he looks at the palms of his hands, and somebody says, "What happened to you?" He says, "Well, that's the way it was, and you were redeemed out of it." Hmm. Yeah, but. Um, I think the significance of all this stuff is still going to be there, but the shame is going to be gone. And I think that's, that's a situation that's kind of hard to imagine right now. I don't want to make a big deal out of that, because yeah. as far as I'm concerned, I could, I could be more than happy with it either way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so just to mention a few more details, Ellen White says the journey of the righteous for leaving this earth, going back to heaven, are going to heaven for the first time for them, Jesus taking them back to heaven for him, will take seven days. So there's, that's, uh, for example, early writings, page 16, that talks about that, and a number of other places. Well, going on the first space trip, we've got a lot of questions we've got to work on. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what then, kind of clock did they use to make sure it's seven <laughs> days? Yeah. Well, 
arriving there, clothed in glorious white robes, she says, all the saints will be standing on the sea of glass outside the city. Two, they will be standing in a hollow square with Jesus in the center. Then the angels will bring crowns from the city, and Jesus personally places a crown on the head of each saint. Try to imagine what that will be like. Four, each one is satisfied with his or her crown. Five, the angels will bring harps from the city, and Jesus personally hands one to each of the redeemed. Six, then the commanding angel and other leading angels with him strike the first note and all sweep the strings and sing praises to Christ. This is what we call instant harp lessons. <laughs> How's that going to happen? Well, Revelation 20 suggests that the saints will then be given opportunity to review in detail everything that has taken place in the great controversy. Uh, you can read it there, Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13. It will become clear to them why some have been saved and others have been lost. They will be given as much time as they need to review the records, to ask questions, and to be convinced that God did everything he possibly could to save everybody. So, just let's look at that final, those final stages of, of government again, or judgment again. They've been divided up in different ways, but let's try the five, five stages. One, the pre-advent judgment is going on right now. Angels in the universe will see that God's judgment is fair. Two, the second coming in which the righteous actually receive the first part of their uh, reward from, for, from the judgment. Uh, the righteous will, re uh, and they were taken to heaven and the wicked are slain. Three, there's the millennium in which the saints will sit in judgment with Christ and agree that God's judgment was fair. And four, there's the third coming. Satan and his angels and the wicked see the panorama after being raised and preparing to attack the city. Realize that everything that could be done for them was done and that God's judgment is fair and admit their sins and errors. Mm -hmm. And then find five, final executive judgment. Sin and sinners will be destroyed, separated permanently from God, the source of life. Now, the verses that we've suggested talk about how that judgment will take place, or each of those stages of judgment will take place, are Ecclesiastes 12, 13, and 14. I'm sure many of you probably memorized that back in school. After all this, there's only one thing to say. Have reverence for God and obey His commands because this is all that humans, were, human beings were created for. God is going to judge everything we do, whether good or bad, or even things done in secret. I have a okay. question. Yeah. Okay, David is a man in God's own... I forgot uh, how he phrased it exactly. After his own heart. After, After his, own, his heart. own heart. Why is David seen as such and other people... Because David sinned quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yet he's seen as such and someone else is deemed uh, wicked and should burn or what have you. What's, what's the difference between the two? The difference is their attitude toward God when, when, the, when they're faced with the evidence. David was immediately repentant when, when he was faced with the, with the evidence. Well, it's rebellion, actually. I have another question. People who rebel are different than people who know that they're sinners. I have another question. I agree, I understand that. But it's, it's also said that God uh, hardened Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. Those people who rebel, or do they rebel by their own volition? Or do, does God harden their heart? Gives them evidence. No, yeah, God, God just provides the evidence, Amen. and the hardening happens de depending on how they respond to okay. God's evidence. Well, look at Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, just to uh, pick another spot. And I saw the dead, great and small alike, this is Revelation 20, verses 12 and 13, standing before the throne. Books were opened, and then another book was opened, the Book of the Living. The dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. Then the sea gave up its dead. Death and the world of the dead also gave up the dead they held, and all were judged according to what they had done. So that's pretty clear about what the basis for the judgment is going to be. So finally, when a thousand years ended, it will be time for God to relocate from heaven to establish his headquarters, believe it or not, here on this planet, which will be a permanent memorial to all that God has accomplished in the great controversy. As the new Jerusalem descends, the wicked are resurrected. Everyone who has ever lived will be alive to see the final events of the great controversy. 
There will be a very few exceptions. You can read about those in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 193, and Early Writings, page 276. But virtually everybody will be alive at the same time. The wicked outside the city, the righteous inside the city. And by the way, if you would like a copy of the handouts that we we'll follow in our, in our discussion, they're available at our website. Uh, that's uh, Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Theox, T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. So what happens then? In a frenzy of excitement, Satan and his angels will recognize their last possible opportunity to win the great controversy. In actual fact, I think it's pretty clear they recognize they're not going to win the great controversy. What do they want to do? They want to get into the city and get to the tree of life. Because, you see, if they, they feel if we could just eat at that tree of life, then we could live forever, too. You think that's a reality? I think it's one of Satan's delusions. Yeah, he, he could chug a lug on the tree of life as long as he wanted, and it's still not going to do him any good. <laughs> well, you can discuss that with him, but uh, he, he will, he, I, think, I think that's his story he will give to the, to the wicked gathered outside there. See that city? If we can get inside there and get to the tree of life, God has promised me. Oh, I'm sure he'll, that's, the, that's the, what he'll say, but I'm yeah. just wondering, is that true? Oh, well, there, for several reasons it's not true. First of all, they won't be able to get into the city. Jesus has closed the gates. Uh, secondly, even if they could, as you suggested, it probably wouldn't do them any good. I suspect that's true. Yeah, so. You know, for for us, any of us to survive, to live, we have to have a connection with God. And Satan has rejected, is rejecting that connection with God. He's going to unplug right. the ventilator. And unplug eating that, from the power. Eating of that tree of life has certainly been talked about as for the healing of the nations and... I mean, Adam and Eve were driven out, and the, and the symbol is so they couldn't get to the tree of life. Yeah. So there's a lot of mystique yeah. about that. Yeah, it did say, though, that if they didn't take it away, they would live forever, even if yeah. they've sinned. But so um, there's something there. But, yeah, I, you know, I, this I, sounds really contradictory, but I think Satan has an incorruptible body right now. And I don't think the tree of life would even do anything for him. That he has a what? Uncorruptible body. Uncorruptible. The, bo the body that can't be corrupted. I mean, spiritual it's, body of some sort. It's a spiritual sort. body. It's it like what we're going to have when, when we're resurrected. Uh, yes. And, um, you know, we have bodies of dust right now. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. He did many insane acts. Yes. This is insane yeah. also. Yeah. And this is uh, a sh show us, show everybody, he didn't change. Yeah. He Precisely. never changed. Precisely. Even if uh, it's a Shows him last that he didn't change. Last, uh, yeah. Yeah, last chance, but he didn't change. It's very interesting. Ellen White suggests that Jesus and the redeemed will actually leave the city temporarily as it descends onto the plain of earth. Are they going to be out there with the wicked? Then she says that the gates will be open in fact, Revelation says the gates of the city are never closed. But then she goes on to say, when they, when they prepare to attack the New Jerusalem, Jesus will literally close the gates. That's great controversy. You read all about it, pages 662 through 664. Mm -hmm. As the wicked are about to attack the city, Christ suddenly will appear far above the city upon a foundation of burnished gold, seated on a throne, surrounded by the righteous, singing praises to him. When the wicked began their march on the city, the gates of the New Jerusalem will be closed. You can read about that in Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, page 215, or Early Writings, page 293. Thus will begin the final scenes of God's judgment on the wicked. And I'd like to read a few comments from Ellen White about how that will actually take place. As soon as the books of record are opened, this is to give us a little idea how this is all going to happen, and the eye of Jesus looks upon the wicked. They are conscious of every sin which they have ever committed. Wow. What does that do to the memory? Um, the alcoholic who's destroyed half his brain can remember all those bottles of beer or, or whiskey or whatever. Yeah. That means it's no dialogue, not excuses, no. not any conversation. Everybody will see himself. Mm -hmm. 
as in a light of God, and every mouth will be shut. Yeah. They see just where their feet, reading on, diverge from the path of purity and holiness, just how far pride and rebellion have carried them in the violation of the law of God. The seductive temptations which they encouraged by indulgence in sin, the blessings perverted, the messengers of God despised and the warnings rejected, the waves of mercy beaten back by the stubborn, unrepentant heart, all appear as if, as if written in letters of fire. Now, where will that be? Just in their minds, just in their vision? Where are the letters of fire? That's volume four of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 481, paragraph 100. Again, Great Controversy, page 666, paragraph 2. You know, there's, there's a lot of symbolism here, though. It's yeah. kind of, kind well, of I, difficult to, to know. I'm tell me what it means. I, I want you to cut through the symbolism and tell me what it really means. Well, that's, yeah, you're right. That's part of the, the challenge right there. Uh, I'm sure that when it, after it happens, we will know exactly what it means. Mm -hmm. But um, it's just like... Jesus making his prophecies and when you see them happen well then you know where the information came from mm -hmm. so Gabriel I uh, may make a suggestion when Jesus eyes look on the millions and billions of people he also looked to the angels each angel will know exactly what he did because this is judgment for them too this is execution for them. They will see each one their part. They will see right and correct judgment. Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Well, another place. Did you want to comment? No. Oh. Oh. no. When the judgment shall sit and the book shall be opened, there will be many astonishing disclosures. This is a Review and Herald, January 1, 1884, paragraph 13. Also in Signs of the Times, May 26, 1887. And Maranatha, the, uh, the um, Book of the Year, I've forgotten what year that was, page 340, paragraph 4. There will be many astonishing disclosures. Men will not then appear as they appear to human eyes and finite judgments. Secret sins will then be laid open to the view of all. How's that going to happen? Secret sins will then be open to the view of all. Motives and intentions which have been hidden in the dark chambers of the heart will be revealed. In another place, I was looking for it and I couldn't find it last night when I was looking, a couple nights ago when I was looking for it. She says, sinners will proclaim their own sins to all around them. I believe when you feel guilty, mm -hmm. when you recognize you are guilty, it looks like it's written on your forehead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Letters of fire. <laughs> yes. It's not, you are not talking with anybody. That's right. You are not discussing with unknown people around you. Right. Yeah. But everybody will feel like uh, it's exposed mm -hmm. to others. Yeah. Yeah. Well, in that solemn and awful hour, the unfaithfulness of the husband will be open to the wife, and the unfaithfulness of the wife to the husband. Parents will then learn for the first time what was the real character of their children. And children will see the errors and mistakes that mark the lives of their parents. And what coming is this? Second coming. No, I'm sorry, no, this is third, third coming. Third. This I is thought third. this is what they went over during the thousand years. Um, I think this is third coming. This is talking about the wicked outside. It's not talking about the righteous. Wicked or dead during the thousand the, years. Yeah. Just talking about the, just not, just not about the wicked outside the city. You can still be talking about. But them, it's, it was the righteous going over the records of the ones that they thought they loved that aren't there. Isn't that what we're talking about here? No, this is talking about the wicked outside the city when Jesus focuses on them at the third coming. Okay. The man who robbed his neighbor, I hope those not, that guy's not going to be in heaven. The man who robbed his neighbor through false representation is not to escape with his ill-gotten gates. God has an exact record in his books of every unjust account and every unfair dealing. 
So this is just the revelation to the yeah. wicked. Yeah. These same issues have already been dealt with exactly. with the righteous. They already understand this. So the there's angels. no new information. Yeah, here. with the angels before that. Yeah. Yeah. I have yeah. just a suggestion. When the word of God arrives people and the angels transport their angels transport everybody from everywhere in a place, they are in a groups. They are in the families, they are everybody mm -hmm. in their own time. They will know, they recognize the neighbors, they recognize the family. Of course, uh, it's terrible. Different lang uh, same language, each group. Mm -hmm. All be organized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in this panoramic view, the entire sequence of the great controversy will be presented for all to see. Volume 4 of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 41 and 42 in Great Controversy, 666 and 667 and some other places. May, <coughs> I, may I ask a question? Sure. All these take time. Mm -hmm. That will be a long time. It's not a short uh, no. reflection. It's God's in no time. rush. Long time of judgment, execution of <coughs> Well, and not only that, um, how long is Satan going to take to prepare his forces to march on the city? It's going to take a while. It may take a lot longer than we think. It's, um, it, there will be no place to hide. The well, wicked will see the truth of everything that has happened. It will then be evident to all that the wages of sin is not noble independence and eternal life, but rather slavery, ruin, and death. Volume 4, Spirit of Prophecy, page 483. The wicked will admit that they were wrong and that God and his law have always been right. Norm, there's your comment. Yep. Satan sees that his voluntary rebellion has unfitted him for heaven. He has trained his powers to war against God. The purity, peace, and harmony of heaven would be to him supreme torture. So hard, to un hard to understand how you can come to this understanding and then have that still true. I, Dr. Provencio, Jack Provencio, used to be one of our professors here at the university a number of years ago, used to say this, and I think it gives me a, li a little hint about how you could explain this. He says, there won't be, any, the Bible says there won't be any gossips in heaven. And Dr. Provencio used to say, well, you could actually let one in. But then if you let one gossip in heaven, it would be hell for him. Nobody would listen to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. The point is, characters are not changed yeah. by this knowledge that they get at that point. Satan's accusations against the mercy and justice of God are now silenced. What, by what? By the evidence, right? Yeah. There's the evidence. And, <coughs> and everybody sees it. There, there's no question about it. They, they see exactly. I mean, I, I sometimes have said, when God puts his, his show in the, in the, in the, across the skies, Steven Spielberg will turn green. <laughs> oh. I mean, this will be a panorama like nothing that anybody's... No widescreen movie theater or anything will be even close. We're, this is going to be live, three-dimensional, mm. just like it happened, like you were there. Fourth, dim four fourth dimen dimensional, fourth yeah. dimensional smell of vision. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the whole thing. <laughs> well, um, the, reproach, the reproach which he has endeavored to cast upon Jehovah rests wholly upon himself. And now Satan bows down. Here's, the, here's your. Mm -hmm. And sa now Satan bows down and confesses the justice of his sentence. Um, let's look at that. That's. that's Ellen White didn't come up with that. That's right in the, in the, in the uh, scriptures. Uh, have a look at that. The most compelling place is, is in uh, Philippians chapter 2. And I'm going to start with verse 5. The attitude you should have is the one that Jesus Christ had. He always had the nature of God. But he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. 
For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above and gave him the name that is greater than any other name. And so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below will fall on their knees and all will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now my question, having read that, you read, we already read what Ellen White said about that. Now we read the biblical statement. And you can go back to Isaiah 45, 23 and Romans 14, 11. The basic message is repeated in three different places in the Bible. What will it take to, to convince or, or to compel, if you will, Satan to be down on his knees and saying, God, you are right. What does it take? Overwhelming evidence. Okay. And that's, where will that be? Where does the evidence come from? The facts. It's, it's kind of it's kind of hard to understand because a liar doesn't listen to the evidence, no matter how compelling it is. It will be so clear. Yeah, but that's just the point, though. A liar, it, he doesn't but if everybody, see. There's got to be something else that's happening here than, but, than what we normally see around we here. We see it every day in court. Guy comes in, I didn't do it, I'm not guilty, I didn't do it, I'm not guilty. And then the, the, the witnesses start coming in and they tell their story and they tell their story. Then the next thing you know, there's a settlement. No, I don't know. Well, I think the difference, Gary, I, I, let, me, let me make my comment. The difference is this, the entire universe is watching every detail of this panorama. There is not one person who's going to listen to Satan's lies anymore. He may lie, and everybody will just say, forget you, that's a bunch of bunkum. Yeah. It's not true. There's, there's nobody to lie to anymore. I can see that, but, but Satan himself, being a liar, mm -hmm. why would he ever admit that he's telling a lie? Because there's nothing more to say. It's all been presented right there across the sky. It's, uh, that's what happens when they admit they're wrong. They admit they're wrong when the witnesses come in and make the case before the jury, before everybody in the audience, and then it's over. Yeah, yeah. I just want to mention, this bowing is voluntary. Mm -hmm. It's not forced. Yes. Right. right. Voluntary because the evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, something happens after that that um, people raise a lot of questions about, and we don't have time to discuss it in detail. But I'll read these words from Ellen White. When this is over, the wicked begin to perish. Some are destroyed as in a moment, Ellen White says, and this is, I'm reading now from a Great Controversy, page 673, and before that, volume 4 of the Spirit of Prophecy, page 488, paragraph 1. Some are destroyed as in a moment, while others suffer many days. All are punished according to their deeds. The sins of the righteous having been transferred to Satan, he is made to suffer not only for his own rebellion, but for all the sins which he has caused God's people to commit. So who is responsible for the sins he's punished for? He's responsible himself. He's not, he's not really suffering for somebody else's sin. He's suffering for the sins that he caused. How does that punishment work? Well, <clears throat> you know, that's a question that I'm going to, I'm going to, we might get to in a moment. <laughs> we'll see. Um, somehow or other, that punishment is going to be similar to what happened to Jesus on the cross. And what happened? He saw himself being separated from the Father. He saw himself being separated from the source of life until finally it just tore him up and he died. These and people, the devil included, are going to say, we don't like to admit this, but boy, the evidence, there's the evidence, there's the evidence, there's the evidence, there's the evidence. And they're going to think about it, and they're going to think about it until finally they say, you know, there's no reason for me to live anymore. I made a whole lot of wrong choices. I turned into a rebel. God, just let me go. Just let me die. Well, is there any sometimes. evidence in the, in the death of Christ of that scenario? Well, yes and no. Here's the problem with the death of Christ. It happened in total blackness. We 
no human being saw what happened. Well, we can't make anything up then, so let's leave it at that. Well, I mean, we have the I, record of the inspired writers. Yeah, and, and the point was, when he felt himself to be t he, that maybe he's going to be totally separated from his father forever, mm -hmm. his human anatomy and physiology could not survive that. Yeah. And he died. Yeah. Uh, now, I expect Satan and every wicked person to die from that same yeah. neurophysiologic problem. Yeah. Well, that's just physical, though. That isn't really coming from a sin or what they've done. I, I'm just thinking that possibly when every knee shall bow, I don't think it actually says that it's going to happen at the same time. That these things are going to, for some people, it's going to happen longer than others, and that's the that's the length of these. Well, it could be. I mean, okay. Well, we need to, we're running out of time here. Let me just finish that paragraph. The full penalty of the law has been visited. The demands of justice have been met, and heaven and earth, beholding, declare the righteousness of Jehovah. That's your demonstration. Yep. All of this is necessary to complete the answers, reading on in our outline now, all of this is necessary to complete the answers to Satan's accusations in the great controversy. No questions must be left in the minds of anyone, not even of the wicked, about the truthfulness and fairness of God's government. There is no reason for Satan to be released at the third coming except to clarify in the minds of everyone that God has always told the truth and that Satan is the father of lies. There must be no lingering doubt about God. We often think of sin as being confined to this earth. Remember, sin began in heaven. And then, after it developed and so forth, God developed his plan, his original plan of, to create a, his original plan to create a beautiful world was spoiled. We know about that. But this new earth would be way better than that old Garden of Eden because now who else will be here? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the angels will all be, in effect, living with us in the Garden of Eden together. Sin, suffering, disease, death, and decay and rebellion will be eliminated forever. Revelation 21, you know, gives you a very brief picture of what the new earth will be like. And I like to read this final quotation. A fear of making the future inheritance seem too material has led many to spiritualize away the very truths which lead us to look upon it as our home. Christ assured his disciples that he went to prepare mansions for them and the Father's house. Those who accept the teachings of God's word will not be wholly ignorant concerning the heavenly abode. See you there. <laughs>